Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on research assessment practices and the precarity of academic careers from the Initiative for Science in Europe, or ISE. My name is Matthew Tata. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Stockholm, as well as a board member of the Early Career Research Advocacy Organization, Eurodoc, which is a member organization of ISE. And as part of the ISE Task Force on Researchers' Careers, I and others recently published a position paper on the precarity of academic careers. Through a lengthy study, members of the task force arrived at three central themes that must be addressed to lessen academic precarity. Those were the funding of academic careers, the assessment of research and researchers, and procedures of grant evaluation. Our examination of current research funding policies discussed the value of shifting funding towards more contract permanence, particularly as the gap between doctorate graduates and faculty positions grows ever wider. We also call for research assessment practices that encompass a greater range of outputs with particular valorization of those with community or societal relevance. And finally, our paper explores the facets and faults of the grant evaluation procedure, which can overlook promising researchers and scientific questions, as well as propagate biases and inefficiencies in RNI. As a, a small disclaimer, ISC recognizes that PhD holders do offer value beyond academia. Um, but we wish to stress that academic careers are the main engine of the research and education sectors, and that most early career researchers consider this to be their future career path, at least initially. But the job is by no means complete following publication of the position paper, and to maintain and broaden this discussion, ISC has put together this webinar series to bring together the perspective and expertise of some very eminent speakers. So two weeks ago, Chloe Hill, another task force member, led a very lively discussion on the role and future uh, of funding earmarked for research with panelists Wim van Schalos of the Dutch Academy of Arts and Science, Rachel Coulthard Graf of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, Maria Ivancheva, uh, lecturer in higher education studies at the University of Liverpool, and Maria de Carvalho, member of European Parliament. So for those that missed it, um, check it, uh, out the ISE YouTube page where you'll find a recording of the webinar and you can watch it at your leisure. Uh, whilst a fortnight from now, uh, Renaud Jolivet, another task force member, is joined by Fredericks Gard of OECD, Catherine McCammon of the ERC, James Morris from Science Europe, and Kasper Goshink from the Dutch National Funder NWO, as they explore current modes of research grant evaluation. And make sure you register for that webinar. Uh, we'll probably post a, a link to that uh, registration page in the chat sometime today. So I'm now going to pass over to Professor Martin Andler. Uh, president of the Initiative for Science in Europe. He'll just give a brief introduction of the organization itself and then of our brilliant panel of speakers for today. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I think you've said it, oops, I think you've said it all. Uh, um, so I don't need to say very much. So Initiative for Science in Europe is an organization whose members are learned societies uh, in Europe at the European level. We are, of course, concerned with all issues about science policy. And of course, we're particularly concerned about the problems of careers of young researchers. And I think it is very interesting that the task force has found, has looked into the more system, systemic uh, issues regarding uh, careers and the connection with the way things are financed. So I think we're going to have a very good discussion and I hope that everybody will be very interested. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll introduce our speakers for today. So um, in no particular order, we're joined by Cecilia Caballo, Director General for the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology and Chair of the ERA's uh, ERAC Standing Group, a Working Group for Human Resources and Mobility. Jan Pomowski, uh, Professor of Modern History at University of Warwick and uh, Secretary General for the Guild. Noemi Oberbon, a postdoctoral researcher at Hasselt University and VUMC in Amsterdam. And finally, Stephen Curry, uh, Professor of Structural Biology at Imperial College London and Chair of the Steering Committee for the Declaration on Research Assessment, or DORA. So I won't give uh, an expansive introduction uh, to the uh, panelists, we'll leave that to them. Um, so in no particular order, um, we'll start with uh, Jan Pomoski, if you just want to give us uh, a brief introduction to yourself and uh, the interest of you and the Guild in research assessment practices. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. So um, I'll, I'll 
you know, I'm I'm a modern historian, and uh, I've been in in universities for, for for all my life, and and I just wanted to, um, and and we we are now within the guild um, that represents 21 universities across 16 countries in Europe. We we are really heavily involved in thinking about careers and and thinking about how the, the problems with with current career assessment. Now, first of all, I want to uh, really congratulate ISC on this really ex excellent paper, really thought provoking uh, uh, paper. Uh, the overall heading in academic uh, in, in of academic precarity. I just want to uh, preface that by just saying that I, I simply do not think we can really make a meaningful uh, change here without states really significantly increasing their funding for higher education. You mentioned the issue of funding, um, but uh, we've, we really have seen funding per students decline uh, over the last 10, 20 years um, in most European states, and that really, really, really needs to be reversed for this uh, problem to be uh, addressed. And I think that the, the discussion um, um, that you uh, alluded to um, uh, in two weeks' time, I think, will be extremely important because, again, in your paper, you raise this really important question about how um, about the difficulties around um, um, peer review. Uh, and I think that that is something we really do need to take on. And I think that is directly relevant to, to what I want to talk about uh, now. So we've discussed this within our, uh, at length already within our, uh, amongst our members. And if you ask our, our member universities whether they have a diversity of assessment practices in place, they would all say yes. And they all have a whole range of categories by which they measure uh, um, quality in academic careers and they, by which they measure the contributions of, of academic uh, work. If you then ask, so you could say, well, okay, job done. <laughs> but if you ask them, well, do we, need to, we need, do we need to change? Are we challenged? And they would all say, absolutely. And we, need, we really need change at European level. And I think what's happened is that there are three fundamental challenges. The first one is the, the fact that a lot of new elements have come into play over the last few years that we need to take into account better. So th these are things around open science, research ethics, uh, and so forth. How do we best account for that? A second fundamental challenge, I think, is around the question of peer evaluation. So um, the, the more you de-emphasize, arguably, the more you de-emphasize quantitative indicators, the, the greater the need for for good qualitative evaluation of careers. And that's maybe what we want. But then the, 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 the importance of peer evaluation increases. So, when, so if we're saying on one level, well, that the system of peer evaluation in academic science is, is broke, but at the same time, we're saying, well, actually, we need to increase that element in the way that we assess careers, then I think we, we, we have a challenge. And, I'm, and, and I think that we really do need to embrace that at the, at the beginning of this process as we think about how to change the way in which we evaluate careers. And the third issue, I think, is, and I think that still that's the, abs at the absolute core of this, is the whole question of research excellence. I mean, really, how do we measure? What do we measure as part of research excellence? And how do we make sure that what we measure is, is consistent um, uh, and fair and transparent. So let me just talk about a few, I can't mention all of these things, but just let me talk about um, some of these uh, issues in, in a, a bit more detail. So the question about excellence, I think there is this, um, uh, I, I don't think that we can say in general, peer evaluation is, is bad in itself. I think it has real limitations, uh, but we also need to constantly strive to improve proven. And I think that you could argue, for instance, that the ERC has found a really good way to do to organize peer review because they do it in two steps. They, they have the, the, the classic peer evaluation, but then they also have a, a qualitative interview that, that they add to, uh, to this process. And you could argue that the results there show um, that it works. And I think that the, but, 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 but I think we would all agree in the Guild um, that um, we that we need to have more qualitative alongside quantitative indicators and the fundamental question then is how do you do it how do you how do you make this in in a way that that is that is fair and transparent across the different disciplinary uh, um, spectra and i think that we we do believe that ultimately we also need to give some freedom to the individual disciplines to also define within their own um, uh, cultures what what um, uh, excellence what is constituted uh, by excellence um, we can talk maybe about this later later but we're not convinced that open science per se is an indicator for individual excellence it is we need to evaluate this as part of an academic's contribution but but whether it's it, it indicates excellence as such we, we, we are not so convinced 
So that, that's the point of excellence. I think that we, when we think about the whole, how we move our career systems, I think that we need to be really careful to count for different paths and situations in Europe. And I think that we need to maybe reflect on the fact that what's good for one scientific system isn't necessarily the same as for another. So um, there are a number of, of systems in Europe where the emphasis in recent years has been to try and lift up the general academic debate beyond the national level to a wider international sphere. So, so telling them that you no longer need international citation metrics has very different implications to when you look at this discussion, for instance, in the Netherlands, a system that's intensely international in the way that it operates. I think that we need to, um, secondly, really think through different national le legislative contexts, um, because in some countries, uh, national legislation really constrains institutions in the way that they can move towards a more qualitative uh, e evaluation. And we need to give institutions the reassurance that they can move and that their national member states will support them. And finally, I think we need to think very carefully about timelines, because um, if we have a diversity as uh, of assessment practice in place already, and yet many researchers feel that there's a publish or, or perish mentality, then that indicates that it's also a question of culture about how we actually uh, translate the diversity of assessment practices in, um, into reality. And that needs time, that needs engagement, that needs bottom-up support, and we can't create that at a stroke of a pen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jan. Yeah, I think uh, it's great that you touched upon uh, the real need for bespoke solutions, because of course, uh, there's such a great heterogeneity in terms of how one particular community or research culture uh, typically reward someone and uh, it can't, we can't apply a, a blanket reforms that uh, would mask those uh, nice distinctions. So uh, next we'll move on to uh, Cecilia Caballo um, representing uh, Eric. Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you for, um, thank you for the invitation. And, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, I represented, which is the as chair of the Standing Working Group for Human Resources and Mobility. It's a group that was established in 2017, and it builds on the work that was um, of the previous group uh, called the Steering Group for Human Resources and Mobility, which is a group that depended on the European Commission. Um, but now the group is, uh, like I said before, depends on ERAC, which is the, the European Research and Innovation Committee of the European Council. And the ERAC's mission with its subgroups, which we are one of them, it, its mission is to advise the European Council on, on the issues of the ERA priorities. As you know, in the previous communication of the um, ERA, uh, that was in the year 2000, um, the priority three was the priority that had to do with the open labor market for researchers. Last year, a new um, uh, European Commission uh, communication was made called the New Era for Research and Innovation. And in this uh, communication, it reinforces the importance of the human resources in research and innovation and acknowledges the need to keep working on the existing priorities, as is priority three of op an open labor market for researchers, but identifies new challenges. This new communication also identifies 14 actions, which um, are highly important for our group. Um, like I said, the group is, has, is made up of the member states and also the European Commission is part of our, a part of our group. And, and one of the actions is to deliver a toolbox of measures to support researchers' careers through a, through a mobility scheme, training and more in order to keep and make Europe more attractive for talent. Now here, the whole idea of research assessment is, is very important. So this is part of uh, the toolbox and the measures that's gonna be um, uh, uh, the work that we're gonna, we're gonna be doing. Like I said, our group works at a member state level. So obviously um, uh, we're not, we, we, we wanna work on is a more the policy framework or maybe go one stop beyond um, what has been done up, up to now. Uh, the predecessor group in 2005 developed what we call what you all know of is, is the Charter and Code. Okay, the Charter and Code for researchers is a very um, was uh, developed in, in 2005, and it's based on 40 principles that had to do with uh, with research recognition, re research recruitment, and research responsibility. Um, the whole idea was to contribute to the priority three of the open labor market, and it was the idea was to develop an attractive, open, sustainable labor uh, European labor market for researchers. It had emphasis on open, transparent, and international comparable selection and recruitment processes. It would it made um, it put into value the mobility of researchers' careers and uh, career development and prospects. And um, so this is the basis that was developed something in 2005, which is 16 years ago. 
Uh, the uptake we know has been successful more than um, uh, we know that in Article 32 in the Horizon 2020 grant agreement, it was the best effort article. So that's what was recognized the Charter and Code. And then the implementation of the Charter and Code was um, was made through the Human Resources Excellence Research Award, and this uh, this was a, this is a strategy that many institutions have taken. Over 500 institutions have taken on this type of uh, this initiative and this logo for recruitment and uh, re research recognition processes. However, we think that um, we need that it's time to review this. It's time to review the process and it's try to um, contribute the, to re revisit the Charter and Code and how can it um, better. Uh, address the issues that have changed in the context from from when it was written to now. So we're thinking about um, the idea how it can improve its framework for researchers, how the skills and rewarding system can be enhanced and revisited, how open science can be mainstreamed in it, gender equality can be main, um, mainstreamed, and also synergies with the Euro uh, European higher education area. So what we did is last year we developed what we call the Triangle Task Force, and the tri Triangle Task Force is basically um, a group where we have three of the standing working groups that depend on EDAC. One is ourselves, the Human Resources and Mobility Standing Working Group. The other standing working group for open science and innovation. And the third standing working group on gender research and innovation come together and we have a triangle task force with two goals. So one goal uh, is to develop recommendations on training, incentives, and evaluation for researchers with open science and innovation perspective and a gender perspective. And the other goal is to review the potential uptake of a charter and code in the light of the future developments. So the idea is to um, gather information on how to um, foster open science and training assessments for researchers with this gender perspective in, in research career assessment. We're gonna, we've, um, we've uh, developed a survey and we're gonna do desk research to, uh, to achieve goal one. And for goal, do, goal two, we're doing also work and how to revisit the 40 principles and what should be improved, where we wanna take on the idea of gender equality, open science, the teaching dimension of research, talent ma management, and of course, the issue of today, which is research assessment. The idea is to propose an evolution, not a revolution. We want to keep the current spirit of the chart and code. Obviously, the chart and code was developed in 2005 and it lasts 15 years. So the idea is we want to keep that in mind. We want to keep a good um, the proposal to keep a reasonable number of principles. And um, we want to be able to have, like we say, a smooth transition and to be uh, um, to propose this change and, and, and see where we need to go, where to advance in, in with respect to these issues. So um, this is what the work we're doing. Uh, we do want to, we are visiting a stakeholder consultation process for the proposal that we've developed so far since the work started uh, mid 2020. And uh, by the end of this month, we want a stakeholder um, consultation where we've, we've already had bilateral meetings with some of the institutions. And, and hopefully we think this would be a good framework to uh, target the change that um, institutions need. And that's all from my side, thank you. Thanks very much, Cecilia. Yeah, I think the charter and code is uh, is a fantastic template in which to start to build in these new facets and factors in in the modern research area, in particular the new era communication and trying to achieve that. And certainly, um, there will be a, a nuanced uh, difficulty in obviously trying to to establish a, a set of principles that uh, can fit that open labour market, which uh, is rather uh, intangible at the best of times. So. Thank you very much. Um, now we will move on to uh, Noemi Auberbon. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you for inviting me here too. It's very exciting for me to, to be here and, and, and to be part of this discussion. So uh, my name is Noemi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher, uh, as Matthew mentioned, both in Hasselt University in Belgium and in uh, VUMC Amsterdam. I'm originally from Canada and uh, I started, when I started studying, I started studying um, re cognitive neuroscience and psychiatry. And I was a bit, um, I got a bit disappointed with how science was working and how, how what researchers were asked to do uh, to pursue their career. And that's what made me change field. And I decided to look at how researchers are evaluated and how they are performing science, but from, from the researcher's point of view. So I, uh, I first worked on research integrity 
and uh, I did a master's looking at research integrity codes of conducts and etc. But uh, the more I looked at research integrity and at uh, misconduct in science and, and questionable research practices, the more I realized that these behaviors are quite often influenced by the environment in which the researchers are, and most specifically by what they are asked to do and uh, by the pressure that is put on them and, and their, uh, their requirement for advancement there for career progression. So uh, based on that, I decided to do a PhD and um, more or less on these topics. And I, so I found a very good supervisor in, in Belgium who was also interested in understanding what's the problem behind research assessments from an empirical point of view. So um, we did this PhD uh, in which uh, I, I did mostly uh, interviews, focus groups, surveys, so it's qualitative work, but I realized a few things that everybody knows, but it was quite interesting for me as an early career researcher to find out these things. So the first thing is uh, that the way we define success is highly problematic. I think we know that, <laughs> um, but most importantly, that the way we define success can also impact research integrity and that it, um, it does not only depend on the researchers, on what we ask researchers to do, but also on what we ask institutions to deliver. And also, so it's something that is very, very systemic and that has more uh, layers than what I was realizing when I was a PhD student who was asked to publish papers. Uh, I also realized that the structure of academia is problematic, the big funnel structure, the bottleneck that this uh, webinar series is on. And that's, yeah, that's problematic for a number of reasons. I'm pretty sure we will touch on these in, in the webinar. And um, the position paper is a very, very good resource on that. But it's highly problematic um, in also in influencing uh, in combination with uh, research assessments. And it also leaves a lot of people to leave academia who don't want to leave academia. And that was also part of my project. Look at the, looking at these people who left and how they, how they faced the departure from academia and, and how that affected them as well. And finally, I also found that um, we know we have a problem. And I think all of these the growing number of position papers is showing that we are aware of the problem. And I think this is amazing. There's more and more uh, position papers, uh, initiatives that are happening, especially in the past five years, I've, see, I've seen really an increase in awareness, uh, but also the, the level of action is not as fast as the level of, of saying that we have a problem. So the action takes a bit more time. And what I found is that uh, nobody feels able to act. I, like as a, as a research stakeholder, the funders don't feel able to be the first ones to act. The, the institutions don't feel able to, the researchers don't feel able to. So we have sort of a problem in which everybody blames everybody uh, for the problem, but there's a bit of a blockage here. And uh, for this, I'm, I'm really happy that these kind of discussions happen where we are different uh, stakeholders discussing about these issues. And uh, I think I'll stop there. I'll just look forward for the discussion a bit more. Thanks, Naomi. Yes, absolutely. I, I remember actually reading uh, one of the, the first papers you published during your PhD and how there was this uh, fantastic Mexican standoff of every stakeholder involved seemingly pointing a finger at another person as the the gatekeeper to um, reform and progress and actually it's uh, it's a whole community effort that really needs to be achieved and I'm, I'm delighted that you feel these moments are a good time to crystallize that sentiment so finally uh, we'll move on to Stephen Curry for uh, an introduction over to you Stephen hey, uh, thank you Matthew and uh, good afternoon everybody I think probably for most important most participants it's the afternoon uh, the, the focus of this meeting is about sort of the career prospects of early career researchers, and I am very obviously not an early career researcher, but uh, but I used to be. Uh, so my first degree is in physics, and I did a PhD in biophysics, 
Uh, and then actually I did benefit from quite a bit of mobility during my postdoctoral years. So I had postdoctoral stints in France at the EMBL in Grenoble, uh, back in the UK at the Institute for Animal Health. And then I had two very happy years uh, in Boston as a postdoc uh, before re actually returning to Imperial College where I am still um, as a young lecturer and uh, worked my way up the greasy pole uh, to the position of professor for structural biology. And uh, I kind of once I had achieved that, I actually started doing a lot more sort of public engagement work, which I did largely through um, starting a blog and writing about, uh, you know, the experience of being a scientist in the UK in the 21st century. And really for the first time that gave me an opportunity to think more deeply about a lot of the sort of meta issues that um, go on in, in a scientific career. I, I didn't talk so much about my research, but all the things that I was involved in, publishing papers, reviewing other people's papers, reviewing grants. Um, and that activity got me involved in lots of debates around things like open access, um, around support for funding. In 2010, we had a sort of financial crisis in the UK and lots of threats to the, to the science budget. So I got involved in campaigning to defend that. And when you're trying to defend research, you have to actually make the case for why it's valuable, why it's an important thing that uh, you would hope that the taxpayer would be interested in investing in. And that leads you then on to questions like research assessment, uh, which often focuses on academic quality and maybe thinks a little bit less, although more and more about, uh, about real world impact. And the thing about research assessment then got me involved in um, sort of DORA in the early years. And I now have the privilege of being chair of the, the steering group of DORA for, uh, since 2017. And Adora as an organization, uh, hopefully most people have heard of it, but uh, actually it's, uh, I think it's still something we need to, we need to work on, but it's probably best known for being um, very critical of the misuse of journal impact factors and, and crude indicators like that in research assessment and for advocating for much more holistic approaches to judging what we think, uh, you know, good research looks like and what a good researcher um, looks like. And um, the uh, DORA as a organization has kind of uh, reinvented itself, I would say over the past three or four years, we have actually a lot more funding uh, than we used to. So support from funders and learning societies and, um, and some publishers. And um, as well as obviously still being critical of the, the impact factor, we are trying to be much more proactive. I mean, I think Jan touched upon the question of, you know, if we're not going to use quantitative indicators and use more qualitative methods, then how do we do that? And how do we do that well? And how do we do that without introducing um, excessive subjectivity and bias um, into the process? And so Dora is very much about now about working with other organizations on these questions. We're also very determined to be international in our scope. So we have an advisory board that um, has members from all over the all over the globe, because this isn't a problem that is located just in Europe. Um, it, you know, everybody finds themselves under pressure to play by the same um, misformed, uh, uh, malformed uh, rules. And increasingly also we recognize that attention to research assessment, I mean, uh, um, always draws in then questions about, you know, how, how does one recognize the importance of changing attitudes towards open science, not just open access, but open data, open code, and, and actually the interaction between the academic community and the wider public, which I think is an important part of that agenda. And one of the, one of the issues around the problematic growth of open access, for example, is about research assessment because obviously people are reluctant to publish in brand new journals uh, because they know that everybody uses the old journal names and the established reputations as a as a measure of success. And it also intersects very, um, um, very much with um, all of the issues around equality, diversity and inclusion. I mean, Cecilia mentioned gender equality, which I know is obviously a, still a major issue, but of course, there are many other aspects to um, equality, many other protected characteristics where we have underrepresentation uh, within the academy. And again, a lot of that relates to research assessment because when we think about, well, what does a, an excellent researcher look like? And if you ask children to draw a picture of what a great scientist looks like, it'll be a gray haired man, white man, 
um, in a lab coat, okay? And, and yet our research community is of course much more diverse than that, but still needs to be um, diversified um, much further. So there's lots of complex and interlocking um, 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 problems and challenges here. One thing, I mean, looking forward to the discussion, but one thing that is very much uppermost in my mind is that there is not some platonic ideal out there that we simply haven't yet discovered that is going to solve research assessment and solve precarity and solve research culture. Um, you know, the problem is far too complex and messy for that. Um, and so there is going to be a constant process of negotiation. I mean, I recognize what Naomi said there is, you know, this whole issue has risen up the agenda in the last five or years or so. It's true that action is a bit slower, but I think that was always going to be the case because action requires real people in real organizations who faced in enormous pressures, some of them internal, self-imposed, many of them external, uh, which we have to negotiate as a as a community and as a range of different stakeholders. I mean, I would say that actually of the stakeholders that Naomi mentioned, I think funders do have a little bit more latitude for, for, for um, action than most uh, because they got the money, okay? And they, they, they who pay the pipe are called the tune to a degree, although often funders are wary I think of challenging the academic community about how they go about things, but I would encourage them to be a little bit more proactive. So we have seen in the UK, for example, the Wellcome Trust, which is a private funder, but a very wealthy medical research charity. So as of January this year, they have a policy that you cannot apply to them for funding if you work at a research institution that has not implemented um, practices of research assessment that are um, either, you know, consistent with the DORA principles. So about recognizing diversity of outputs and, uh, you know, not having an over-reliance on metrics. And that is getting people's attention and that is starting to move the gears and the wheels at a number of institutions. I think it's a very much a work in progress, an awful lot of problems still out there, uh, but hopefully we will see further action in the, in the years to come. Great, thank you, Stephen. And yeah, thanks for also framing uh, research uh, assessment as a, as a commitment to society. I think we tend to think of research communication as the way that we return the debt of tax paying towards uh, R&D expenditure, but actually the way we incentivize and recognize and prioritize certain research questions is again, a matter for the public to, and they have a personal stake in it. So I'm grateful for you covering it. Great, so thank you to each of our panelists. We're gonna now move on to some questions. Um, these are uh, open to any of our panels, so jump in whenever you wish. Otherwise, I may uh, direct the question towards specific people or at random. And then we'll move on to some audience questions. I see some already popping up in the Q&A, which is brilliant. Please, if you have one, put it there. If you don't, but or you, maybe you're not uh, willing yet to share it, but you like the sound of someone else's, give an upvote and it's more likely to be asked. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with a, a nice uh, blue sky perspective, as most researchers' uh, mindset tends to be, nice and optimistic. So in an ideal setting, what features and qualities should underlie a successful academic career? Uh, what features and qualities should underlie a successful academic career? Stephen. Why don't you take the floor? Um, so uh, I, I think I've just made the point that I don't have an ideal question, an ideal answer for that. But what I like about this question is that it uses the term qualities, plural. Okay, so so Jan in his remarks talked about excellence um, um, on a number of occasions, and certainly at Imperial College, if you visit our website, you'll see that the word excellence is used very, very liberally. Uh, and to me, it's a very problematic term because actually nobody has a good definition of what excellence means. And I like the idea of qualities, plural, and this is an idea borrowed from Cameron Nalen, who's a very thoughtful person who's reflected a lot on um, research quality and, and open, open knowledge because I think we want to be able to define all of the different things that we value. And that then comes from, well, why do we think research is important? And I do like the point of emphasizing, um, you know, sort of research that plays out in the real world and that is relevant to people's lives. Uh, because I think actually that's one of the things that brings a lot of people into a research career in the, in the first place. 
particularly perhaps in STEM fields, you know, science, engineering, medicine, whatever, but I wouldn't limit it necessarily um, to, to all of those. And that's obviously people want to change the world. They want to discover treatments and therapies and, and, and those sorts of activities, which don't necessarily result in academic papers. I mean, academic papers is, is in some ways a byproduct of, the, of that overall goal, but our research assessment is focused very much on um, on the, the sort of the academic output, uh, which isn't necessarily always the, uh, the most important one. So I think, you know, finding ways to shift attention towards, you know, that those kinds of qualities. Of course, you know, uh, blue skies research and knowledge that just enhances our understanding of the world as well is massively important too. Valuable in and of itself because it's part of our culture as a human uh, society. I think we want to devalue it, and also we know history teaches us that you know just basic discovery work driven by curiosity leads unexpectedly to many great things that impact the real world. We are you know talking together now, um, thanks to video conferencing, con conferencing over the internet, which was an invention that arose from uh, you know research into high energy physics. You know so. Um, uh, so there are, you know, I think we have to recognize those, those benefits too. Great, thank you. Yes, Stephen, absolutely. And uh, the, the idea of using qualities in plural is to highlight, of course, that there are, there are so much more to what we typically produce as, uh, as researchers that actually have a profound benefit and are not just uh, altruistic uh, gain. Uh, do any of our other panelists want to um, take a stab at a very open-ended question? Noemi, take it away. Um, yeah, I, I'll just add a little, a little thing because I agree with everything that Stephen mentioned. Um, but I also, there's also one thing that is present in most of the current documents that are um, saying how we should reform research assessment is uh, to look at the researcher's contribution to the research community as well. So of course, to society is, uh, it's the end point. Um, and we say, okay, now we look at citation impact factors and things that are only within the research, research community. So we have to look outside. And I think that's the, the main message, but also the other contributions of the researchers within their community uh, are very important, not just the output. So part of, my, part of my research showed that we only look at the outputs, the, the papers, the patents, the, the citations, but we never look at the process and this is really the thing that's missing and I think uh, for example if you were in a company and you look at uh, how a researcher uh, how a, an employee what is a good employee in a company it's someone who does good work so very good quality work and someone also to help your company evolve and grow so how do we help the scientific system evolve and grow is also part of the process so by peer reviewing by uh, supervising, being a good supervisor to students, uh, providing within the, the community is also important. I think. If, if I may come in, <laughs> okay. um, I, I support what, what Naomi has said and what Stephen has said. I think um, like the what we're doing in Charter and Code, I think the key part is in an ideal setting, what, what is an ideal setting? And I think that's what the work, what we're trying to do is um, revisit the charter and code because I think that's what they tried to do back in 2005 and say, okay, what is an ideal setting? What are the working conditions? What are the recruitment process? What are the characteristics or principles that have to be taken into consideration for research career? based on the fact that the research career has to be considered a profession per se. And we haven't reached it yet. And many of the things, if you read the introduction of the Charter and Code, what they claim in that, in that introduction of the situation is still valid today, unfortunately. It's, there's still things that are, the research is not considered a profession yet per se. I mean, we still have, there's a lot of things to be involved. So I think here um, we need to work on what ideal setting means also uh, before, on top of getting what features and qualities should uh, should be taken into consideration for an ideal academic career, I think the ideal setting is important too, and I think we need to work together and 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 define those just the the, the common ground and the setting for that, and that's what we want to we want to come forward in. So, just to add there. Yeah, thank you. I think yeah, no, you and Noemi are touching upon this idea of professionalization about how deprofessionalized the academic sector has gradually become, or even has has always been. Uh, and as a result, there isn't this uh, effort to tend to it and to try and um, create this uh, holistic and collaborative environment. In fact, someone once proposed to me the idea that 
we could be a collaborator to somebody in the academic environment you're working without ever working with them. And that would just come from creating an open and trustworthy uh, community. And that would then implicitly benefit um, all researchers around us, not just those that we work with. Um, Jan, did you have uh, your uh, point to make? Yeah, just a couple of things. I mean, you know, um, something, uh, just, just two quick points raised by, by what Stephen and Cecilia kind of said or represent. I mean, so, so I think that we, um, first of all, I think what I associate with an academic, you know, with, with, with a successful academic career is, is international mobility. I just think, you know, universities are international and the way, the difficulties of moving across countries is still shocking in Europe, it, it seems to me. And that is why I think the work of Celia and of Iraq, et cetera, is just so, so important and why we really do need to address that. At, at, and this is also really about around academic cultures, you know, what is what is valued in some um, in some academic cultures in one country, it can be completely different from what is valued by the same subject in a different country. And I think that's, that's just um, a, a, a huge issue that we need to really, um, uh, confront. The other thing that that still ha that hasn't been um, just mentioned, but I think it's just so important is 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 service, is collegiality, and I think Naomi, I think you touched on that a little bit, but I just think that institutions, universities, they really rely on people being collegial, on people doing stuff that that in a sense is not, you know, it's just. You know, de you know, looking after students, um, especially in difficult cases, where which is hugely time-consuming, and there's so many, you know, for just one as one example, or, or, or dealing with, you know, right now, you know, in, in at a time of pandemic, switching over, changing your pedagogies. I mean, there's just so much that people do, without this ever seeing the light of day, without this ever being rewarded and 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 and, and recognized. And I just think we also, as part of that discussion of our academic careers also really take take that on board, I think, sometimes. Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, uh, the, the qualities we define are going to be highly subjective, and we need to prioritize and protect that subjectivity, but um, also uh, recognize, I guess, sometimes trying to establish some benchmarks is fundamental. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, for sure. So, um, okay, we'll move on to uh, another question, which I guess fits in very uh, closely with the objective of the position paper that ISE wrote, which um, we're going to ask now about how the panelists think contemporary research assessments actually influences academic careers. And this was obviously touched upon in, in some of your introductions. So, and in particular, we're talking about precarity here, you know, diminishing the longevity of academic careers, maybe even also the impact and the satisfaction of those. Um, yeah, and let's start with, start with you. Um, so I think that the, um, it just has a huge impact. And, and I've, I've just been a, in a discussion in the, in, in the Q&A um, uh, part here um, about the, uh, um, uh, about my comment, uh, so this is with Toma, uh, about my comment that I don't think it, this affects, um, this should be, um, um, uh, that open science should be an, a market for in the individual quality of an individual scientific uh, excellence. That does not mean that we shouldn't encourage the system to move towards open science. It doesn't mean that there are many other things that we should do. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't encourage institutions to provide the setting which, which enables, encourages people to move to, towards open science. But I think, do think this is a really good example of the kind of impediments that we have at an individual level. So if you are um, an early career researcher and you face the choice between publishing an open access journal or in nature, what are you going to do? Are you really going to be so bold to say, actually, no, I'm going to go for a for an open science journal? Um, uh, you know, where if, if knowing that actually it's the Nature article that could really make my career in, currently as we are. Um, so I think this is so. This is how um, um, or think about interdisciplinarity. I, I think we probably re no, not probably. I think we do have to acknowledge that if that that given that a lot of the evaluations still happen in in um, or ref referees still happen at, at at subject level, that interdisciplinary researchers still have a huge mountain to climb when it comes to third party funding, when it comes to also their own research um, uh, career assessment. Um, and I think that's that's a condition really of 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 um, you know, of, of how the, the current assessment structure really limits um, the the risks that people are are willing to take. And yet we all know, know as Noemi uh, mentioned, we all know that the system needs to move to this, but the impediments are there. And that's why I think we really these are just two of the examples. I think that we really do need to embrace and the things that limit us. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, there are obviously initiatives to try and uh, tease apart um, this you know, difficult dilemma that a researcher has faced when approaching things like open access. I mean, I'm curious to see how Open Research Europe fares and whether it's able to take excellent researchers and, and will them to make the plunge towards making their science openly available. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's always going to be a problem. And, and uh, obviously, this was something that Noemi worked on was this uh, divergence and discordance between scientific and and career advancements and and how often it is easier to take the low road whenever whenever it uh, appears. Do any other other panelists want to chime in? Um, yeah, Stephen, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I sort of I recognise the the tensions that are raised by the question. Um, trivially, of course, Jan, there's now no conflict between publishing in an open access journal and publishing in Nature because Nature has an open access option. It's just extraordinarily expensive. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but nevertheless, the dilemma is there. And particularly for, you know, early career researchers who are looking to build a CV that, you know, they, they hope will get them onto the, uh, the academic ladder. I think there is a tension because I certainly, my own conversation with early career researchers is often they're very actually invested they haven't yet had their idealism ground out of them by the system and so they have very noble aspirations that their work is going to change the world uh, I think they're very comfortable with the whole idea of the sort of open science agenda because they've grown up with an internet in a way that my generation certainly uh, uh, certainly didn't but at the same time of course it would be extremely unfair to expect them to take risks that you know I didn't take at their at their age um, and that's why I do think it is very much incumbent upon the old guard uh, to sort of ease the way and to, and to make the changes. Up. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I've got involved in DORA and, uh, uh, and I'm you know, campaigning for that, because ultimately we have, to, we have to have a system where people are judged on what they've done, and it should not matter. We know that you know, not every paper in nature is a, is a brilliant one. Uh, and we know that there's lots of spectacular work that, uh, you know, just never is published in disciplinary journals. And so, you know, it's really, you know, we just have to pull ourselves away from the idea that these aggregate indicators and tokens of reputation are, you know, that are, are that. They're sort of average measures. You know, on average, a paper in Nature is going to be more important than a paper in the British Journal of this or that, okay? But actually, that's not going to be true of every paper. And clearly, we need a focus on, you know, when we're uh, assessing individuals, we focus Focus on the individual and 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 what they have done. So, um, but clearly, I think you know people have to be canny. You know, you cannot be naive in this world um, if you are trying to forge uh, forge it. So, I, I do have a great deal of sympathy with the dilemma that early career researchers face. And my own sense, actually, from talking to my own PhD students and postdocs over the years, is actually they are much more aware and sensitive of the pressure that is, is on people now to publish in a top tier journal. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard people say, you know, if I don't get a nature paper, my career is over, you know, and it's, uh, and, and it's, it's actually tragic that we have created a system that does that to, uh, to young people. So, um, and I, well, you know, I do think the moves, what Dora is doing and the work that many funders um, are doing now to, to, you know, to recalibrate the way that we do research assistance is absolutely, absolutely essential. Um, and 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 hopefully we'll then you know share the burden with the early career researchers who are pushing to change the system because they see more clearly than most um, the the flaws within it. Yeah, so it would be wonderful if uh, your average researcher spends as much time reading the recommendations of Dora as they might the author guidelines for something within the Nature Publishing Group because um, then the the real impact becomes apparent and actually the. The, the reshaping and resizing research to fit a specific, um, almost arbitrary goal like publishing uh, can obviously diminish its, also its return for the researcher too. Uh, Noemi. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that because, um, I mean, one of the points that Stephen mentioned is how, how we evaluate individual researchers. And I think that that's one point it's very uh, uh, theoretical because it's, I, I'm not a policymaker. I don't know how we could make this work. Um, but research assessment, the fact that they focus on the individual is also part of the problem. We, we assess researchers on their individual CV, on their individual career, on the individual work that they've done. 
And there's no focus on the team. There's no focus on how they, uh, well, I mean, like I said before, how they contribute to the community, but also how they are working in a team. So everybody expects a successful researcher to have the profile of, of the single PI. And that was mentioned in the position paper also, moving away from uh, the, the expectation of the big leader, a uh, single PI, that, that's the role that everybody should try to aim for. So we have no diversity in, in, how, in what we expect from researchers. Everybody's meant to fit that, that mold of, of becoming a leader and not someone who is a good team member and can be the third author of a few papers, uh, uh, can do the statistics, can help can do a lot of peer review, but not necessarily be the leader of a lab. So that's also something that I think uh, is important to consider. And that's, I find very absent in current research assessments. Wonderful. I think actually uh, the, the questions in the Q&A are blowing up in such a way that we should probably move on to one or two, because there's a real focus on implementation here. And we actually have two sides of the coin, uh, questions concerning about um, local practices, institutional or even individual, and then also a question earlier on about uh, systemic changes for the long term. So I think given we've talked about bespoke solutions, um, I'd like to maybe turn it back to systematic change. And Cecilia, obviously you're here um, kind of with uh, the representation of all the member states and that are part of the ERAC. Um, so I think obviously maybe I've approached this the wrong way because I know a lot of researchers like to think about things going on at a local scale, but um, how do you think um, ERAC is, and, uh, and even the whole ERA is trying to approach this on a systemic level? And I guess using the Charter and Code as, as one of the, uh, the tools in said toolbox. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Yes, I think that's, that's the idea. I mean, uh, we, have, uh, we know that the European policies have a tractor effect and, and this is what influences later the, at the institutional level. So basically, the, the, all the, uh, the, the things that have been mentioned, the whole fact that Naomi said about teams and how, how research assessment of a team is important, what Stephen said about the leadership, how the older generation have to lead the role to make this change happen because the young, uh, young career researchers are obviously um, open to this type of change, but it has to come from, from the senior researchers too. And so these type of issues, these type of things are something that we're seeing, they have to be embedded in, 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 in this policy framework, in this toolbox that, the, that is, has to be developed. One of the ways, obviously, is um, the what I said was talking about before the ideal setting. This whole the the, heart, the charter and code, whether it's called charter and code or whether it's called whatever it's called, I'm not sure what it's going to be called. But our proposal is to talk about how careers should be assessed, how the recruitment process should be should be made, what are the working conditions, what are the the real values that need to be taken into consideration. So we we we've taken the 40 principles, and we revisited them, and we're talking about again now. Um, grouping them in, in there's there were four pillars and before one was called ethical and professional values we want to revisit that and then we group it into research and ethical values and here we want to talk about research and academic freedom we want to talk about um, the recognition of research as a profession we want to talk about res re responsible research open science gender equality diversity the whole like john was saying before diversity is more than just the gender part and this has to be mainstream through through the whole um charter and code Recruitment selection is pretty much the same where we're going to group the principles there. And war, before we were talking about working conditions and social security, here we want to talk about working conditions and professional aspects to the whole research profession. And then also um, it, there, was a, there was a grouping of training and development. And here we're talking about talent development and research evaluation, where the whole issue of talent and the teamwork is, is also taken in, in consideration. So the, the idea is that is setting the basis at least at the policy level so that it can be later influenced at the member state level because that's all we can do. At our level, we, we set the scene and then it, the national member states uh, uh, take it on in their, own, in their own direction. Yeah, absolutely. There, is, there are such limitations, I guess, in terms of uh, the, the values that are preached at a, at a wide scale like that and then what a country perhaps chooses to embrace um, when, the, when it comes down to it. I, I'm curious as to what the panel think, whether there's Sometimes a, a, a minor conflict that, of course, will take place between the, these top-down edicts and then the autonomy and 
free will institutions have to then trial and pilot their own initiatives. So of course, recently Dora uh, highlighted, I think 10 cases of um, uh, research assessment reform. In fact, one university again, I know is part of the guild. And I'm curious as to, um, you know, what it takes for them to have the, to be unchained. And so to effectively pursue uh, a new research assessment platform um, and diverging possibly away from uh, the culture and even legislation in their member states. Is the question to me? Uh, we go for it, Jan. And, and, and so, so, so. so first of all, I think we need to be really careful before we expect universities to diverge uh, to, to break the law of their, of their member states or the legal the legal parameters. So I, I, I don't think we really want to encourage that. And and it is a serious point because you have uh, some systems that are you know, so, so there are there are whole range of national constraints in different country and not every constraint is like the other so there are some countries where there are broad national parameters but they're so broad that they still give institutions a lot of freedom and others they're, they're, they're quite tight and so we really do need to um, you know acknowledge that. Um, I, I just wanted to, to say something about I, I still think that we I still think there's a problem here because we I think we all are agreed around the diversity of issues that we need to consider. Um, and, and, and Stephen, I, I, I agree that we need to talk about qualities in the plural, but when I talk, but, but I think there's still this question around the quality of the research in terms of breaking the boundaries of knowledge, the frontiers of knowledge, right? Um, and, and so I think that um, we can, we, we, we need, and, and I think one question is, um, or one danger that I see that if we have a whole range of parameters that we're now adopting, is, is this idea of the superhuman researcher who has to be good at everything. And then we can still say until the cows come home, but no, you need to be good at some things. In practice, assessment panels might still create the expectation or we might somehow inadvertently create a culture of expectations that people have to be good at everything. And that could be reinforced even, even inadvertently by the fact that there's this enormous demand, this enormous excess demand for tenured positions from this from this large number of 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 uh, you know uh, researchers uh, on on limited contracts so, so which yeah, you pointed to yeah and then would, would you argue for then maybe trying to establish uh, researcher archetypes so i mean sometimes career tracks exist where for example you have someone with a split academic uh, so teaching and research yeah. uh, commitments does it does it make sense uh, i mean obviously drawing hard lines in the sand can be problematic if researchers um, and academics wish to then diversify or or leave their lane at some point, but is an archetype a, a useful thing to pursue? So personally, I, I quite like the idea that you have different type, type of career tracks. Again, there are different national constraints around this. So, so for instance, in Germany, you have you know civil service positions for for professors, and yes, you can have a, 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 a in many states you can have a, a, a teaching track, but that means you have one less uh, professor on the research track when there, there's so few positions there that, in a sense, you you know there are incentives against that. But but I really you know I would really would urge us all to try and get away from these constraints and first of all really think about what it is we want and then really have these conversations with our states about how we can uh, then encourage that and, and and based on the principle you know that we I mean certainly a discuss, discussion that we already had early on whereby I think we would ideally like to 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 recognize the diverse talents that people bring to the system I personally would 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 like us to kind of see that that we can have a sort of slight more diverse career track that where of, of, of that is then recognized and esteemed equally. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes, Stephen, you had your, your hand up earlier. Uh, I, I did. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got a point I'm going to make, but I want to come back to Jan on the point that on the quality versus qualities. I mean, uh, he's advocating you know, real quality is about breaking boundaries or breaking new ground. It's sort of, you know, a real major discovery. But um, I and obviously, um, you know, research that does that is really important and is certainly to be valued. But I I'm a little bit cautious about it because I think most research actually and even if it's good research doesn't doesn't necessarily do that. I don't know how much ground I broke in my 
uh, in, in my research career. And I've certainly heard someone say, and I think it might even have been Otterling Laser, who is uh, now chief executive of the UKRI, say that it, you know, if everybody's breaking ground, nobody's actually building anything, you know, so all you end up is with, with your gardens destroyed. <laughs> so, um, and I think behind it is also, it's kind of sneaks in the subliminal idea and it comes back to what Naomi said is that, you know, a, a researcher is seen as the lone genius, as it were. And, and this is a myth, okay? and there, there have been a few from time to time but I don't think that's a standard most of us would like to measure ourselves by and yet I think we still would argue that we do you know valuable work um, through our career so I would I think there may be a challenge in recognizing different qualities but you know people do a really solid piece of research that um, that confirms or uh, or even you know is produces a negative result disconfirming earlier nature paper whatever that's extremely valuable and we should uh, we certainly should value that there's the whole question of negative results which under our current regime of research assessment people never publish them and yet that leads to a great wastage of effort um, because, uh, you know, nobody knows that the, it's already been tried and it didn't work. And so, um, um, so, so we, I think we want to be aware of, you know, all that, that kind of diversity as well. Um, recognizing different contributions and having diverse career tracks, you know, people who do research and teaching. Well, actually, we have a lot of those in the UK already that are called academics, you know, who work in universities, you know, that are all doing research and teaching. Okay. Uh, maybe a few of them were under the mistaken impression that they could, um, join a university and uh, just do research, but uh, and maybe a few of them still get away with it. But I think less and less uh, these days. And as somebody who served as director of undergraduate studies and had to organise teaching, uh, that's a view that I certainly reinforced among my colleagues. But actually, one of the things I would like to see to tackle this idea of precarity, uh, and now this may be a particular feature of the UK, I'm not so familiar with funding regimes um, across Europe, but um, we have moved to a system where almost all research funding is awarded competitively. There's very, very little core funding in most universities. And so if you're a, you know, if you get a faculty position at a university in the UK as a lecturer or a reader or whatever, um, you're on your own, okay? You might get a bit of a startup package, it depends on the university but you have to go out and fight for the money and that can lead to very great turbulence and what I would like to see is a restructuring of the funding to create um, long-term sort of researcher positions for those people who come through as PhD students or postdocs who are really great in the lab, love being in the lab, but actually have no real aspiration to be a PI because they look at their own PI and the sort of hangdog expression on their face, are kind of worn out by all their various different um, um, duties and whatnot. Uh, but, but, but then find it hard to maintain a career as a postdoc because they get older and they get more expensive. And so, you know, I'd like to see a system where anyone who has an academic position, they're granted a, a five or a 10 year position for you know, a, a senior research officer or, you know, a senior postdoc or a senior technician, somebody that they, that they can rely on. The funding would be renewed as long as they continue to be reasonably productive. And to my mind, that's a much more efficient way to work because then you've always got somebody in the lab. All other funding, I would still have awarded competitively because I think you need some competition or else people get a bit get a bit slack um, but to me that would reduce a lot of the turbulence and and it would create um, long-term positions for those who come through the system and just you know develop a real love of research but not a real love of academia as a whole and the sort of very um, um, and broad demands that it puts on people. Yeah. Maybe that's pie in the sky. <laughs> no, thank you. And I mean, you, you hark back to our first webinar, which was uh, really framed around reapportioning uh, funding towards giving some stability so that uh, we can mitigate the uncertainty that comes with first starting a, you know, independent research career and, and uh, put pay to the commitment those individuals have. And particularly if we're starting to apply those principles to researchers that have a diversity uh, in terms of what they offer, um, then that obviously will have a particular value and benefit for the academic sector as a whole. Um, so we can move on now. I, I, I feel like I'm missing questions in the chat. So um, I will come to one actually that probably uh, really centers a, a lot on what we were just discussing. Uh, so how do we address the issue of productivity that is currently rewarded but as Naomi pointed out, may compromise integrity and also rewards those that can survive the system. They may not necessarily be the most creative or best managers or communicators. So how do we address the issue 
of productivity. Naomi, this feels like it's partly pitched to you, but uh, of course all the uh, panel uh, are welcome to chime in. I'm, uh, yeah, uh, how do we address the issue is a difficult one. <laughs> um, and well, so right now I, I would say in, in my, so from my project, my project was really looking at the Flemish research system. And that, this is where most of my knowledge is. And I know that um, in, in that system, I would say that the, the modern problem was the way that uh, research institutions are funded by the government and the way they are ranked by international ranking systems. And that was, uh, I would say, one of the key issue that if it doesn't change, it will be hard to see a change in the rest. So let's say the way the Times Higher Education ranking ranks the university, if they keep on looking at nature papers, uh, um, Nobel prizes and things like that, uh, then the universities will find it very difficult to change. So I would say the first uh, thing to change, well, as Stefan mentioned, funding has a lot of power, but also the ranking and the reputation uh, system uh, has to change. Um, and in Belgium also the, the government attributes funding to universities depending on a certain number of outputs. So the graduated number of graduated PhD students, a uh, number of graduated master students, uh, but also the number of publications, uh, the impact factors and things like that. And that was a very big player. So I would say this is one of the first thing to address, but how? <laughs> That's a, that's a question that I guess uh, Cecilia or Jan might be better at answering. Good deflection, Diana, but I would agree uh, that uh, <laughs> there, there, there needs to be obviously a, a sense of how you can incentivize or even sometimes sanction. I mean, Stephen mentioned obviously with Welcome in the UK that there is a very clear uh, you know, line drawn that obviously you will not find funding if you don't adhere to uh, certain principles. Um, would anyone like to come in on this idea of uh, productivity and how actually it can compromise uh, integrity and, of course, reward the, uh, the gamers, the ones that know how to um, hit the right metrics and pursue the right deliverables? Um, if I'm a comment, I mean, because this is alludes to something I, a problematic I raised earlier, which is that I, I think that in a number of lower performer countries in Europe that you know national system have been geared up to to reward anybody who publishes in a web of science journal which means that in a way those system have, have outsourced their judgment of quality to web of science <laughs> um, which clearly is a problem right but you can see why they've tried to do this because if you are in a, in a, in a say in a small country where everybody knows each other and effectively you've always evaluated yourselves and you have a you know you, you have a language that very few people speak then then how do you get to that to that level of 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 raising the bar and making sure people are internationally competitive and so I just so 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 you know I'm, I'm just raising it in this context because this is this is a, a system that, that then rewards people who play that kind of game in a way that doesn't necessarily relate to research quality, but in a sense that's almost the inverse Flanders model because the Flanders model is we're doing you know that the universities are doing very well in the in, you know in in, anti, in international discussions as as evidenced by rankings and other things. So here you can have a very different kind of discussion about how to move away from that system to the other type, the other problem where, where you're trying to get more into the international limelight. How do you do that if you then go back to your own assessment? I, 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 and I personally, I feel that what we, if we are serious about creating a kind of international discussion about this, we need to find ways to talk to each other about what we value. And we need to find maybe there's a way of, you know, having, you know, Warwick, we have, you know, somebody from another faculty is always on, on different faculties panel, etc. So, so could, could we have it, a system whereby people from other systems sit on evaluation committees in, in universities, for instance, or something, just, just to make sure that there's just more interchange um, across borders, you know. 
Yeah, actually, there's a you touched upon this uh, this idea of international cultures, and it, there's a question in the uh, audience Q and A that fits this quite well. So uh, the question is, I have the impression that this discussion is very Western slash Northern Europe driven, on one hand, and excellence uh, defined by an institution driven on the other. But what's going on in the rest of Europe? How to bring those institutions to the table who are out of these discussions? So of course, um. Part of uh, the Horizon Europe budget discussions were about the, you know, the, the aspects of widening participation, um, and in many cases, of course, um, it's the high rankers, it's the, you know, it's it's the the universities with a serious research output that might be um, researchers and re institutions themselves that might be kind of setting the tone and defining the discussion. So, and maybe this is this is good. Cecilia. Obviously, you're you're having to integrate all these different voices in the in Iraq. I'm curious as to yeah. how it works. Yeah, we, we are actually right now it's the Portuguese presidency um, that is uh, leading the European um, Council and uh, it, the high priority in this presidency is the whole issue of research careers and research assessment. And um, I mean, I, I think I have to come back to what Jan said in the beginning that this whole issue is about the, the open science context and research ethics, the peer evaluation and research excellence and that's a debate about the research community. And, and so it's an international debate and it's how, um, in, in the end, it's the researchers themselves that have to change the system because the, the metrics weren't de developed by the policymakers at all. <laughs> the policymakers didn't invent that. They didn't, they didn't invent that. They, they use it to, for funding or for the criteria to when they write the, 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 the criteria to, to, to grant funds or whatever, but, but it, it's the research community that has divide, de defined this and, and defined these, all these metrics and all these systems. And, 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 and we don't, and I don't think the research community wants to define a research hero at all. So, so again, so we have to come together, and um, and so here the policymakers, and at least that's what my is. We want to listen to the researchers, and we want to help you or help the research community come together and come to an agreement on how to change. Because obviously, I don't think it's 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 from a policymaker side what what they don't have the answer to 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 these issues that come out. It's it's we have to hear and see what's best and what's works, and so. For some, you know, what 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 has worked in the past has worked, and and I think like John said. That, uh, some of the countries that said, okay, if, if you publish in WASP, you get you get a you get a merit in Spain. The law of 1986 said specific, specifically if you publish in WASP. The new law of science doesn't say that, but the previous law of 1986 did say that. So so yes, you know, we, Spain made that effort in 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 you know 30 years ago, but not anymore, um, or 40 years ago. So the the, the issue here is. The voices are on the table and they're talking about it. So I don't think it's a, just a northern western debate at all. I think all the countries have come together, at least in Europe, it, it's on the table. It's a discussion. But again, it's the research community that has to come in agreement. And we don't want superheroes of researchers doing being experts in everything. Um, but we have to come to agreement on how what how research should be evaluated and what the best sense and that we agree with it. So um, the policymakers are listening <laughs> and, and we think it's important. So um, we just have to figure out what, what, what the answer is. And I don't, think, I don't think we know it yet. I, know, I think the problem is there and we're aware of the problem. It's just coming up with a, a good solution. Yeah, and, and hopefully now you have uh, an additional input. So of course you have the, the respective ministries of said ministry, uh, member states, but now also, as Nomi points out there, the frequency of the position papers, the crystallization of these public sentiments can now feed into setting these standards, and actually, there was a, we had a question in the in the Q and A, which was uh, again about um, the charter and code, and around trying to inbuild in values of research culture. And of course, that becomes an entirely subjective uh, entity uh, when we when we treat different uh, nations. Um, um, Stephen, yes, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I wanted to come back to this question of sort of you know, domination by the Northern Hemisphere, and particularly maybe Europe and North America. I, I mean, I think it is true that the, those the, those communities do dominate these debates. Um, and one of the things that uh, um, we have discovered at Doris in setting up the International Advisory Board, which has got good representation from the global south, is that you know, from those parts of the world, we hear that, you know, they feel very much under pressure, often from their governments or university systems, to participate in university ranking um, schemes and to publish in journals that are in Web of Science, because otherwise they're not really getting on the international um, on the international map. And so they do feel terribly aggrieved that they're being forced to play by rules that they had no 
uh, no chance in constructing. And um, and and from Dora's perspective, perspective, um, we think it's absolutely essential that you know these voices are made you know louder and louder in the um, um, in the debate. And actually, I, the, and I was at a meeting this morning of our uh, a sort of subcommittee within Dora, and we are looking again at our governance actually to try and make sure that. Um, uh, our governance structure really is truly global and is is bringing those voices um, um, into the um, into the discussion on the question of productivity and rewarding productivity. I mean, that's again, that comes back to this question of tension or whatever. I think one of the answers is to actually diversify our measures of what look, got good productivity looks like. Um, and, you know, thinking again about, you know, if we uh, have create mechanisms for publishing negative results, because sometimes productivity is a matter of sheer blind luck. OK, you happen to be working, and I think particularly in science, you know, you happen to be working on a project and it comes good or, you know, I, my, I'm working structural biology and so I work. Um, my field is protein crystallography, and that's a you know I tell my postdocs you basically you're not a professional, but you're a professional gambler, okay? Because if you don't grow crystals of your of your protein, you got nothing, okay? And that's ninety percent of the work, you know. It's it really is a very odd thing uh, to spend your life on, and and you can do fun fantastic work, and then you get scooped, of course, uh, you know, by somebody else. And so we do have to recognize, you know, good quality work that doesn't necessarily produce. You know the high impact paper and and you know the the, the way that some of behaves in the lab do they help train master students and things that are they a good communicator so we do have to diversify as well and just recognize uh, more overtly the way that luck plays a role in all of our careers you know as i don't believe in destiny at all i believe in basically a random walk through life that suddenly gets you um, you know on a zoom call talking about research assessment to a bunch of europeans <laughs> <laughs> Very well put, yeah. Um, so uh, unfortunately, as, as one might have expected, uh, we've, we've already used up 80 minutes of our allotted 90. So um, actually, the way I wanted to kind of round off and finish the webinar is a nice opportunity to, in fact, in integrate the, the most popular question we had today. Um, so uh, as with the previous webinar and the, the next one, uh, ISE would quite like to get one action or initiative or sentiment from each of the panel to help lessen academic precarity through research assessment change. And in fact, the, the question that has been most popularly upvoted was, um, well, it's a question such comment um, that so they would be interested if panelists knew about good practices, institutional or individual, where research evaluation is done well. So I guess what I could say is we end this question or the, the webinar with you know, a, a point or an initiative you think should be followed. And if you have um, a case study or an example that could substantiate that, you know, where you've seen positive change, um, then that would be um, a really nice way to finish. And um, we'll try and limit our, our answers to uh, one to two minutes each, if possible. So anyone jump in, otherwise I can point. I'll go first because I won't give an example because we're gonna, we're, we're gathering them right now. Exactly, that's what we're doing in, in our task force. With, through, the, through the Triangle Task Force, we're gathering good practices, we're gathering, um, uh, examples and and we want to bring these forward and and we're going to have a report to bring these ideas coming forward so that um, basically the the idea of, of improving research assessment and 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 how uh, new ways of uh, implementing research assessment in this new context of open science uh, gender equality etc and with the revision of the charter and code can come forward so we we as a group uh, member state group we've gathered examples and we're putting them in and then and that, that will come forward so so hopefully that will be coming forward maybe I'm not sure in how many weeks but that will I don't have a, a clear example yet, but that we're, we're doing that. I think it's important because we do share share among the member states um, the ideas and and what uh, what is what has been done in the member state countries. So, but but that is brilliant because I can say as I mean uh, I and my early, early career researcher colleagues often feel in a position where policymakers and those making decisions high up lack a uh, sense of reality, and that clearly is not the case where you're actually. Mm -hmm. Um, getting down to grassroots initiatives and seeing where we are, um, we are. We're, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Over to you. Yeah. Just a couple of things. So I, I mean, the example of Ghent has been mentioned, and I, I, I really like what they're doing. I, I really, I'm inspired by this, where they're saying actually, you know, Nate, you know, give us three things that you're particularly proud of, and tell us why. So, and then it's up to you to kind of articulate. 
um, uh, and, 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 and tell the story and you can back it up by metrics, but, but it's ultimately down to your narrative. Um, we still need to see how that plays out. It's, you know, it's still relatively recent. So, so I think they're still gathering experience. That's why I can't say categorically, this is the great example because we just need to see. The other thing I would mention that I, I find really inspiring is the University of Glasgow. They've, they've, uh, they've got seven broad parameters and you need to be, you know, make a case for promotion, for instance, in four of them. One of these is collegiality. And I really like that, that because it can be collegiality in research, you know, so you're part of a research team, but it can also be also be collegiality within the institution. That's what I was referring to earlier. I just still think that's really undervalued. And I think that's 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 really positive. Wonderful. I love this this idea of defining your own narrative because of course that is something that has been uh, stripped away from the average researcher with the uh, advent and then uh, praise that the, the general impact facts are obviously has received and the, it should now be down to the individual research to show what they're proud of because then also if you know that that is an expectation for you later on in your career where you have to show it show what kind of uh, research you, um, you you want to demonstrate yourself to be then you start to tailor your activities and your own priorities to meet that. Um, Stephen uh, Noemi uh, a, a point or uh, uh, an idea an initiative to go forward from today um, well, uh, th actually, this question seems tailor-made for Dora because uh, actually we do have a collection of case studies um, um, posted on our website, and then there's also a tab on resources which identifies um, various papers and uh, examples of good practice, which we've been collecting for quite a long, long time. And so I think an encouraging message is that actually there are lots of institutions out there, like uh, Glasgow, uh, for example, and like Ghent, which is one of our case studies. Um, um, where you know good things are happening, people are trying things out, and and some of these experiments may not work. They may have unintended consequences that you know it's difficult to predict in advance. But there's an awful lot of good experimentation around going on around. One that I would highlight is work that's going on at the um, Charité Hospital in Berlin, which is part of the Berlin Institute of Health, where they have um, sort of pioneered a sort of narrative CV type approach, which has gained popularity with a number of different institutions and funders. Again, a bit like as Jan says, says, you know, tell us about your three most important contributions and why you think they're important. The subtext being don't say it's important because it was published in nature. Okay, that's not a reason. Okay, tell us, give us the broader picture and give us a narrative that, you know, speaks to a um, 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 speaks to uh, um, a broader audience. And so I think, and th I mean, there are potential issues with narrative CVs, because again, it's the, the applicant gets to write a description of what they think is important. And so um, there are possible um, um, opportunities for bias to creep in with the way, different ways that men and women present themselves, uh, for example. And so one has to be a little bit careful and mindful of that. But I do think that is a way of, of in institutions tailoring the CV to their own needs and, and they can say, well, what are the things that are important for them? And actually Berlin has a section on, you know, what's your contribution to open science? You know, because that's something that they think is an important activity. They, 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 they value it. And I was pleased to see that, you know, UKRI are going to introduce this kind of short CV or a narrative CV format. They're calling it a, a resume for researchers, which was developed by the Royal Society and a range of funders and and Dora has some input into, into that construction. So I think that that is a, a good initiative and will help to change the conversation about, you know, what good research and what good researchers look like. And it will give us a, hopefully a much richer and more diverse spectrum of qualities. Fantastic. Yeah, and I'd say the, the experimentation side is, is incredibly important. Reading the recent Dora case studies um, report, it, it seemed amazing that one of those trials at, I think it was UMC Utrecht, was to get professors, postdocs, and PhDs into the same room. So essentially their experiment was to have all stakeholders have a conversation with one another. So hopefully uh, more of those uh, experiments can um, uh, be sort of in, uh, initiated and then uh, well reported on like Dora has done. Thank you. Noemi, um, uh, if, if you do need to leave, I know you have another event after this. Give us, a, give us your uh, one piece of uh, advice or a suggestion. It's okay. I mean, uh, I was just going to refer to the Dora, the new Dora collection. So uh, there's much more information in there than what I could ever think of. 
um, we're also part of a, the, my postdoc project in Amsterdam is to build a toolbox for institutions on how to promote research integrity. So a bit like Cecilia, we're also trying to accumulate examples and there are a lot of very, very inspiring examples out there, but I, I won't go too much in the details because uh, the, Dora did a wonderful job at that. So I think that's the key resource, but I also want to mention that from the from the research floor, there are there are also initiatives that can start. Um, so, for example, just uh, openness to discuss these issues. I know in my university, for example, when I started working on research assessments, um, I raised the issue with the doctoral school because we they put emphasis on impact factors, and and then they offered me to teach about impact factors in the doctoral school to PhD students to to raise awareness to to raise these issues and and show what is going wrong with the system and how we can as young researchers also uh, do better science in face of this system so i think that also these these initiatives coming from the ground to help us um, be resilient before the changes really happen are also very useful and i think it's the universities can give a platform for that, maybe even funding for that, for their uh, PhD students to put together discussion groups and things like that. Brilliant, and I, I knew you would end with being quite humble. At the end of the day, you're, you're actually actively working on this theme as a research. So um, yeah, I think the general message we've extracted from this is to, is to keep tabs on um, these different pilots and initiatives. And of course, if you happen to be somewhere uh, that's fortunate enough to be trialing this, then be involved. You know, these, um, these in innovations need to be uh, widely implemented at those institutions and that involves all elements of the research community taking part. Um, okay, so I think we have to finish there. Um, thank you so much uh, to Jan, Noemi, Stephen and Cecilia. It's been a really brilliant conversation. And thanks everyone for tuning in um, today, contributing your questions and your comments. Um, so today's uh, webinar, has been recorded. Um, so you'll be able to watch back on YouTube if you wish or share it amongst your network. And I think a short survey will also be um, sent out soon um, just for you to contribute your own ideas about solving academic precarity. And don't forget that in two weeks time, the final webinar in the trilogy uh, will take place uh, exactly the same time discussing research grant evaluation. I believe that a link has been posted in the chat. And please, if you haven't already, check out the uh, position paper behind this webinar series. It's not a long read. Um, it should be digestible by most. Um, and uh, there's also a number of different links to uh, useful sources that uh, maybe uh, new beginners in the, the world of uh, research assessment can start to see uh, where change is taking place. All right, so uh, thanks for joining and uh, see you all in the fortnight.